Today, I continue the homily series that I started when I was here a few weeks ago. I've been gone the last two Sundays up in the northern parishes, um, so maybe you don't remember when I introduced that. But to help remind you, it's going to be on a number of cultural issues of our day. And so when I was last here and introduced it, uh, it was the purpose of this series is to give you greater encouragement to be able to live and defend the faith, especially with so many voices that seek to contradict our beliefs. And so then, the last two weeks, going back up north, first I spoke on the limitations that science can do to help understand our world and and the need for also faith to be able to answer some of the most important questions about who we are and what leads us to happiness. And then last weekend, again up north, I focused on, in order to make sense of a lot of the church's teaching, we need to reflect upon the way that we look at the world as Christians, the way that God has revealed to us through scriptures. And to summarize that very briefly, God is the one who created us, created us in his image, able to know and to love in a way like him, made for relationship with him and and relationships for one another. Male and female, he created us from the very beginning. But unfortunately, through the envy of the devil, as we heard in last week's readings, the devil brought about sin and suffering and death into our world. And that distorted who we are and disordered many of our thoughts and our desires and our actions. And that included an attack on God's plan for the complementarity of men and women, especially in marriage and family life. But things don't end there. Wonder of all wonders, God came to wage war against the enemy, to right the wrong, to heal the wound, to rescue us and restore us to the great freedom of new life through the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so now, each of us are invited to respond to his invitation, to be joined to Christ's body, which we call the church, and to receive back our identity as his beloved children. Not just so that we ourselves can be healed, but so that we can help all others come to know him as well. And in short, what I've just described is the core of the gospel message. It's what we're all about as Christians. And it's the context in which we must be in order to understand who we are and the Christian vision to be able to understand all of these different cultural issues of our time. So if you want to go back and listen to any of the previous homilies I did, we have them all on our website, recorded, or through our Facebook pages. But tonight, I want to now apply this good news of Jesus Christ, to the first of a number of the cultural issues that I'm going to be going through. And the first one I'm going to speak about is abortion. And I've talked about this one before, but I knew that it needed to be in this series as well, especially since our bishops here in the United States say that working against abortion is the preeminent priority because it directly attacks life itself. And thinking about it perhaps in the context of our celebrations for our country this weekend, that in order for us to experience liberty, in order for us to experience freedom, we must first have life. So, going to science very briefly, basic biology observes the fact that a new human life begins at the moment of fertilization or conception. And we take that scientific fact, we combine it with the Christian vision I just explained, that human beings are created in God's image, and so we have an inestimable value and dignity that means ending human life, even if it's at the very moments, the very first moments of its creation, is a crime that's gravely contrary to the moral law. So our pro-life position is basically that all human beings have an equal right to live, regardless of how old they are or how young they are, regardless of whether they live in the crib or the womb. All human beings are equally valuable, and so we protect them. It's as simple as that. 
And so those that are convinced of it might ask, well, how could anybody disagree? And how could abortion be supported by so many? Ah, because of the next part of the gospel message, right? But the envy of the devil, sin has entered the world, and he has come to deceive many. Abortion is is an example of just how far the enemy, that angel, will go to bring sin and death into the world. And behind the reality of abortion is a number of other distortions that he brings to souls. Temptations such as lust and greed and fear. If you think about lust, it's all about adults thinking freedom is being able to do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, with whomever you want to do, with no consequences. But that's not really freedom at all. That's enslavement to one's passions. You know, it's searching for love, but it's doing it in the wrong way. Those with that idea have lost God's original meaning of what intimacy is all about. It's supposed to express a total commitment of self-giving love of the husband and wife to one another within marriage, with the openness to the new life of children. So the first one's lust, and then greed, too, the enemy brings in. We see that in an industry that's turned abortion into a huge business, often preying upon the fear of vulnerable young women. And that's the third one where the enemy's at work, in fear. It's a huge tactic that he uses. And to illustrate this, at the end of this past school year, there was a graduating senior who, during her valedictorian speech, called using that speech for the protection of the right to, for abortion. And she said that I have hopes and dreams and ambitions, and I'm terrified that if my contraceptives fail, then my hopes and aspirations and dreams and efforts for my future will no longer matter. Listening to those concerns of hers makes me wonder how did it happen that this young woman is terrified of life without abortion? And the answer really does come from a lot of recent psychology research that confirms the mindset of women often seeking abortion is is one of of crisis. That the, the woman knows, even on a subconscious level, that that is her child. That it's a human being. But the unplanned nature of the situation is really a threat to her survival. Unable to see how motherhood fits into her identity, to have a baby would be the death to the life that she thought she was going to have, that she had imagined for herself. And so she's faced with a choice, either my life or the life of my child. And the choice of abortion becomes one of self-preservation. And that's the idea that's taught by our culture of death, that children aren't gifts, but they're burdens, that motherhood is the end of all of our dreams, the disintegration of hope. And it's a terrible, dreary picture of what life and womanhood is. And that's precisely what the abortion industry, and I would say what the devil himself, wants women to believe. Because at the same time as women are told that you're very strong, then at the same time you're treated as though you are very weak. That you need, perhaps, to pay someone to kill your own child in order to be happy and successful. And that's a message of helplessness, of fear, to be afraid that your life is going to be over. And the only way out is through bloodshed, through death and destruction. But that is a lie. It's a lie of the enemy. Because the good news is that God does not abandon anyone. That yes, certainly in the church we we teach not to engage in those kinds of activities outside of marriage because Jesus Christ has come to bring us freedom from being slaves to our passions and to restore us to living the original plan of great joy within committed relationships of marriage. And Jesus came, too, precisely for those who fall into the weakness of their sins. 
Jesus came to forgive and to heal even the wounds that are caused by abortion. Because there's no sin that's beyond his mercy. His is a message of hope, not of fear. A young woman who's facing an unplanned pregnancy need not despair that abortion is her only option. And we can say to her, you can choose both yourself and your child because you are both beloved children of God. That you don't have to give up your dreams when you become a mother. You may end up changing your goals and because your priorities change. And it's true that it can be more difficult, more challenging to do certain things as a parent, as I'm sure many parents know. But nothing has become impossible now that was not possible before. Nothing is impossible for God. And what the Lord says to St. Paul in our second reading today applies here as well, that he says, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So in that situation, as a parent, far from having one's dreams erased, they now have dreams that are multiplied. Additional hopes and plans for the future. Greater hopes and plans. The designs for their life has expanded. Next weekend, I want to continue to apply the good news of the gospel to another issue that's kind of in the background behind the issue of abortion, and it's that of contraception. They're very connected to each other, actually. So in speaking of the church's moral teachings, our eyes have to be fixed on Jesus Christ. We have to speak of his good news. Because he hasn't abandoned us to the miseries of life. Because God's power works even more when we're faced by our weaknesses. And so our role in this is to respond to his message with great hope and love to be a church that doesn't abandon anyone. And that means not only defending his teaching, but even more being a family that supports our brothers and sisters in need. Because we won't be able to convince anybody else unless we ourselves have met Jesus and are convinced of his love and convinced that his power is good news and that he can transform us. Jesus in the gospel today is unable to perform the mighty deeds that he would like to do because the people of Nazareth lack enough faith. But if we live with great faith, then we have yet to see the mighty deeds that our Lord will do here in our midst, in our country, and in our world.